up at a time. Tea time. Yeah. This is tea time. Yeah. Make a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. And as you can see, Miss Liz is having a couple of little glitches today. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but, you know, good old technology. Let's just thank it for what it is, right? So today we have the incredible Lisa Demi joining us for tea. And she's going to be sharing thanks, empathy, and advocacy. That's right. We're going to be serving a different type of tea. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, your juice, your water. You do not need to drink tea when you're sitting and enjoying Miss Liz's Tea Times. So before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Ring that little doorbell and subscribe to the channel. What does Miss Liz have to offer you over there? Well, there's over 300 different interviews from all walks of life, all different types of topics. So I guarantee that there'll be one tea time that you'll like and you'll enjoy. Um, so let's get the disclaimer going. Let's get the bio and let's get Lisa in here and let's spill a good, strong cup of tea together on this incredible Thursday afternoon. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time Show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookymissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to vol voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Ms. Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all Tea Time shows are hosted on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless it's a special surprise or rescheduled Tea Time, which are done on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So now a little bit on my guest. Well, who is my guest? Lisa Demi is a fun, re relatable, inspiring keynote speaker and change artist. She has a passion for inspiring others through her compelling stories and original art to show them that even small steps can accomplish hard things. She captivate, ca captivates audience with the delivering clarity on change, kindness, and standing out. Audience members often say she was speaking to my exact situation. In her spare time, she does CrossFit, so laugh at her jokes a lot. She is also literally an artist and might share a few pictures of her latest masterpiece. And she's Cuban and Italian. So she knows people. So compliment her art a lot. Uh, bears repeating here, laughter and compliments. I mean, why not be safe, right? Lisa's mission is to inspire the world through kindness, laughter, art, and the transformational power of small acts of bravery. Let me get Lisa in here and let's spill some tea together. Welcome, Lisa. Hey, Miss Liz. How are you? I am good. And yourself? I'm doing great. So, Lisa, let's get into who you were as a little girl and who you are now as a oh grown my woman. God. <laughs> um, as a little girl, I, I don't think I was much different, um, to be honest with you. Uh, I was I was that little girl who the teachers always said she talks a lot in class, and um, I was just you know bubbly and and got into trouble a lot not because I was bad but because I was curious about everything and I just wanted to be around my friends and talk and hang out and have fun you know so I'm I'm still kind of the same person. So you were a talker. I was a talker. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, and you're a motivational speaker, right? So look at you, <laughs> little yeah. girl, to big girl. Yeah. Now I'm getting paid to talk before I was getting in trouble for it. Yeah. 
a lot of things have really changed, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I like how how that how I just threw that in little 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 girl and big girl because your book is called little the little book, uh, the think small the little book yeah. with big impacts. Mm -hmm. So you see the little and the big go together. So uh, let's talk about that book a little bit, uh, Lisa. So how did it start and what's it about and all that good stuff? So it started because I do a pre presentation about breaking down your goals into small steps and uh, i wanted to have a companion piece for my presentation to be able to give it at some of my engagements and um i wanted it to be a very small book because i didn't want it to be another thing to add your to do to your to-do list and so i wrote it up and i you know i i actually wrote the book before covid and then promptly sat on it for, um, let's see, when did it come out last year, I think? I, and sat on it for like three years. And, um, you know, because it was another thing to do, just if I'm being honest. And, um, but I wrote it because I wanted to be able to, to have, give something to people to say, here's what I just talked about. You don't have to, like, I wanted them to be able to be present in my presentations and not have to take a million notes. And all they had to do was just read this book and they would get the same thing, you know, in bullet points, basically, in, in written language that I just talked about on the stage. And um, and then it turned out to be this really, I mean, I didn't do it to make a ton of money. I didn't do that. I, I have always wanted to write a book. And I wanted to um, have something that I could just give a little something to somebody so that maybe it could change your life in some little way. So how did you get the title for it, Lisa? Um, because what, so this, what I was talking about, something that I, like a, I guess a philosophy that I live by is called small magic. And it's the philosophy of taking small steps or doing small things that can make a big difference in somebody's life. So I thought, all right, well, instead of, you know, everybody always says, let's, let's think big and let's take on everything and let's do everything. And then you burn yourself out. And so I said, what if we do the opposite of that? And we think small because if you're doing smaller steps, then instead of burning yourself out, you're going to have all these little tiny successes and little tiny goals that you're reaching that all add up to that one big goal that you're actually trying to accomplish. I like it because I, I'm that turtle in the back of the race, right? And I'm just like, I'm coming, I'm I'm coming real slow, but I'm still running that race, right? And exactly. I think it's really important to give that message out to, to everyone because, you know, we're, mm -hmm. so many people are focused on the rabbit, but forget about the turtle, right. forget right. about the kangaroo, forget about the cat. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they just focus on the rabbit. I want to be mm -hmm. the rabbit, you know? And I think it's important that we put it out there that, they, you know, little steps make big impacts as well. Absolutely. Yes. You know, um, so Lisa, when you were in school, because you do a little bit of CrossFit, I seen here in your bio, <laughs> <I do. laughs> what was your favorite, uh, um, uh, sport in school? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I think I liked basketball the best. Uh, honestly, if girls could play football at the time, I probably would have loved that. Um, my little niece plays football. They have it in her school now. And I'm like, man, I, I missed out on that. But I think I liked basketball the best. I just liked all sports. I loved getting out there and running around. And I could never really shoot, to be honest with you. But I could absolutely, I was a like I was a, a, an all-star for defense. And I could get the ball and give it to the person who could shoot. And I loved doing that. I loved it. So what CrossFit, what, what do you like about CrossFit? Um, two things. Uh, so CrossFit is, I'm, I'm an, uh, an extrovert. I'm sure that doesn't come as to any surprise to you, but I'm an extrovert and I get my energy from people. And, you know, I've always been a, a workout person. I've always liked to go to the gym, but I wanted to try something different. And I'd seen CrossFit and I thought, all right, that, you know, that looks, that's like a community. And so I thought, let me go check it out. And I fell in love immediately. I I made friends. I've made some amazing friends in CrossFit. You know, they don't let you off the hook. You're not in there by yourself doing your own thing. You're working out with other people who are encouraging you and, and, you know, helping you. It's like the, the, the adrenaline of, of people shouting to help you just makes you do better. So 
that that's what I really love about CrossFit is not only are you getting a great workout, but it's it's the community. Well, and you're getting pushed for the accountability as well, right? Totally. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I have some friends when I first started working out, if I didn't show up at the gym, they'd come down here and get me. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. I want to talk about accountability, accountability, because that's something that we don't really talk about in today's society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people will say they're, they're going to do this, 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 but they don't have an accountability partner. Do you have an accountability partner besides the CrossFit? <laughs> I, so I've had several accountability partners in my life. And uh, that's actually something I talk about in the book is get, I call it a mean friend. And, um, and what I mean by that is it's someone who won't let you off the hook. You know, so like I wouldn't want my my mom or my you know sister to be my accountability partner because my mom would just be, you know, oh, you worked so hard today. Just go sit on the couch and have a glass of wine and watch TV and do nothing. Whereas my mean friend would be like, get your butt off the couch, get it in here and get in the gym and get work to work. Um, so I think having accountability partners is really good for me because it's not, you know, like it's easy for me to talk myself into not doing something. But if I have someone who I know is going to yell at me or be disappointed, or if I've made a, a deal with someone that I'm going to show up, then I need to do it. Right. And yeah. I, and I, and I think that we need more of that. We need, not that we need more meet friends out there, <laughs> <laughs> but we do need that person that pushes us right to the limits yes. and yes. sees it yes. within us. Because a lot of times we we'll, the outside will see what we don't see. Right. And then we have somebody mm -hmm. that says, you know what? I see this in you. I see this potential in you. I see that you can push yourself a little harder. I see that you can do five more push-ups. You, mm -hmm. you know, and we're telling ourselves, can't do it, can't do it. And and then they're like, come on, one more, one more. It's, yeah. it's like in yeah. the CrossFit, right? It's like let's yeah, go. Let's absolutely. Do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But our coaches are really good about doing that too. They uh, you know, they know what we're capable of and you know, they don't like to let us take a shortcut or, you know, try to, you know, pawn off something on the day, they'll be like, nah, I know you can do more than that. So yeah. So that's really good about that community as well. So let's get back into the book a little bit, Lisa. <laughs> so I like the word big impact. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you put that into the title, what were, what were you thinking? What were you looking for? So I think that people think they have to take big action for big impact. And we all, I think we all by and large want to make a big impact. We want to leave a legacy. We want to, you know, leave our mark in the world. And I think that I, you know, it was kind of a juxtaposition of thinking small, but it can lead to big impact. And so that's why I put that in the title of the book, because I wanted people to know, hey, you don't have to climb Mount Everest to make a big impact. You can, you know, I live in Florida and in the United States, and, and we don't have a lot of mountains here but I can still make an impact by hiking in my backyard or, you know, across the street and in my trails. So I wanted to let people know that it's available for everybody. You don't, you know, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to be anybody extraordinary to make a big impact. You can do it if you take those small steps. So because you're a motivational speaker, was it easy to write this book? Um, <laughs> You know, it's so funny. It was easy to write the book, but actually publishing it was scary um, because I self-published on Amazon. And so I uploaded the transcript. You know, I had it edited. I, I had some friends review it. Um, but once you publish that thing, man, it's out there and everybody's going to see what words you wrote. And it's scary because then people could criticize you about what you said or make you a target because of an opinion you might have. So it was really scary. It wasn't hard to write it. It was hard to publish it. Um, but once I did it, like now I'm like, I can't wait to write this book. You know, so um, the first time I think was was probably going to be the most scary. Yeah. Well, I think it's really scary when you self-publish, right? Because it's you doing it all, right? It's you. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And once you push that button and it's published, uh, I know when I did my books last year and it I was like, oh, shoot, there's no turning back now, is there? No, no, it's out there. It, I mean, I I literally had it ready to go in. I did KDP publishing on Amazon and I had it ready to go for like, I think I had it ready for like four days and I just couldn't bring myself to actually hit the live button. And finally, I was just like, I came into my office. It was still sitting on my computer and I just went, and I pressed the button. I was like, 
And then I walked out of the room because I was like, all right, I did it. I'm done. I got it done. Let's I'm go. out of here. So, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it is scary because writing a book is not something that everyone does, but when you do it and you, it's, it's like a self-accomplishment for yourself as well. Man, I felt like I could climb Mount Everest when I, when I published, I'll tell you when it really hit me was when I got my author's copy um, from Amazon and then I, you know, everything looked good. And then I, uh, bought like 200 copies for myself or 500 copies. I can't remember because I had a book signing event and I got this big box of books and I remember cracking it open and just like, these were all my books and it just was insane for me. It just was like, I can't, I mean, I, I definitely was emotional doing that. It was just something like, I just never had thought I would actually do it. And then I really did it. And I was, I, I was proud and, and, and like just super emotional and all the things all at one time. Oh, it's like having a new baby, right? Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. But like you go Absolutely. through the whole transformation oh, of it, right? God. It's like the carry and writing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, that it's building, right. And it's growing yeah. and then poof, it's here. And it's like, wow. And to hold a, your hard copy and your author's copy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it is emotional and it is like climbing Mount Everest. So you can, you can say, you know what? I mean, ticks off. I already did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was definitely a, a pivotal moment for me, for sure. It's something I won't ever forget. So do you have any plans of writing another book? I do. I actually have two other books written, both. Uh, I wrote both of them before uh, COVID. The, the next one I hope to have out by the end of this year. Um, and I'm, I have had, it's been edited already, but I just want to beef it up a little bit more and, um, and make sure that it's covering everything that I want, but it's, it's called, um, Aunt Boo Boo has a girlfriend and, um, it is my story of, um, my coming out, um, to my family. And it's a, a story about that, but it's also a story about how my mom was my, uh, what's the word I want to say? Like my mom basically was the person who made it okay for me to feel good about myself. She was like, she's the person who was my voice before I found my own voice. And she is the one who paved the way for me to be totally fine with being however I wanted to be in the world. And not only that, but totally fine for everybody else for me to know that I was okay in the world. So. So how old were you, uh, Lisa, if you don't mind? When you, when I came out, came, when you came out, uh, I was late in life. I was 23 years old. And, uh, um, I, uh, it was, so this was a few years back. Um, but my mom was just awesome. And she knew, I mean, my mom, my mom already knew. And, uh, she just, you know, certainly she wasn't, um, she was sad because she was sad that I couldn't tell her about it before that. And she was sad that I had gone through whatever I had gone through prior to, you know, us having that conversation, but she never treated me any differently. She, she never, you know, I got married and she, um, you know, I was always treated my wife, like a, a member of the family and just made it that, you know, anybody who was in our orbit, that I was fine and that there was nothing wrong with me. And I was no different from any of the rest of her kids. Well, I think it's really important when a parent supports as well, right? It makes it a lot totally. easier. Yes, absolutely. I, I was fortunate because um, a lot of my friends didn't have that same support and uh, I did. And I, I am so absolutely thankful for that. Well, it goes right back to the small steps, right? The small, yes. the small, the small yes. steps to big impact, right? Yes. You, you know, your yes. life revolves around what we write and what we share, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I was doing my homework on you, Lisa, I study my, <laughs> I study my guests, right. <laughs> Mrs. Goes to school and does her homework. Uh, you know, I notice the impact that you make with your motivational speaking as well. You try mm -hmm. to bring in your life experiences as well through your speaking, um, to impact, because I think when we start sharing our real stories and our real authentic selves, it makes it a stronger impact to our audience and listeners as well. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely feel like 
bringing my personal experience. That way I'm not just telling you about something that I learned. I'm telling you about something that I know, um, something that I experienced myself, something that I have actual knowledge about. And I also feel like vulnerability is a, a really powerful tool. And I don't use it as a, uh, in order to, but I use it because I, you know, I, I remember when I, when I've seen speakers before, people who've really resonated with me, they got vulnerable. They let us see who they really were. They let us see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I strive to do that anytime I speak or anytime I share anything. And, you know, um, have I gotten some, some feet, you know, some clap back from it sometimes? Sure. Um, but by and large, I think people really, um, appreciate the honesty and like you said, the authenticity. And the truth is, is I, I want to work with people who are authentic, who will let their hair down, who don't always have to paint this, you know, what is it? Social media is the, the yeah. big lie. Right. And I think that we, the comparison game, which I'm absolutely um, uh, guilty of playing myself is, is strong. And, you know, so I want people to see, Hey, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I get upset. I get sad. I get depressed. I, you know, all the good and the bad, because that's what real life really is. Well, and social media has us comparing ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when it gets heavy and we get told a lot, Oh, don't be saying that. Oh, don't be showing that. Oh, we don't want to see that. Uh, you know, and, and then a lot of times it'll be, Oh, well, what are you looking for a pity party? Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you're just expressing that you're a human being. And yes. those are the people that I want to work with as well. Lisa is because mm -hmm. I want to see that somebody's having a hard day and I don't want to mm -hmm. just see wine and roses all the time. You know, right. because life is yeah. not wine and roses. Life is hard. We do have our ups and downs. We fall. We mm -hmm. all fall, you know, but we all get back up and that's our story. Um, and that and that's what I really appreciated when I when I looked into you a little bit, Lisa, and I seemed like I was like, oh, I like this. I like I like where what she's doing, because I think we need more of that at the table. You know, we need to show that, uh, you know, that we can be human beings. Uh, you know, we do get a lot of flack. I, I know myself, I get it. I, Miss Liz yeah. don't do it that way. And I'm just like, you know what? This is who Miss Liz is. You like it or you don't like it, right? It's not a yes. cup of tea for everybody. Exactly. I, I don't have to, everybody doesn't have to like me. Uh, everybody doesn't have to agree with me and that's fine. Um, but I will tell you that, um, you know, I think disagreement is healthy. I think it's the way you disagree that can be um, uh, d destructive. Um, you know, I, I always tell people, Hey, I, I'm cool. If we disagree, explain to me what it is that you're, you know, give me your side because I, I'm, I could be wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I, I want to know what it is that I have that I'm, you know, that I'm misunderstanding. Um, but you know, with the, we won't get into politics, but the political climate that we have here in the States is just not allowing for a lot of that. So it's really hard to keep your head up, but yeah. I feel like, um, I'm, I'm a great believer in sharing your opinion because I think opinions are what bring about change and your voice is what brings about change. And if we don't voice our opinions, then nothing will ever be different. Absolutely. And that's what, what I really like, Lisa, is because you're a change artist. You're a woman mm -hmm. that's coming in and saying, you know what, we need change, but we need opinions. Mm -hmm. We need feedback, right? If you don't get feedback, how can you fix anything? How can you find a solution? Totally. You're totally. just repeating the same pattern, right? And you're same yeah. same. If everyone's just like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's not fine. You know, it's okay to say it's not fine. And if we're doing something that doesn't resonate with you or, you know, we can improve ourselves, let us know because without telling us, how can we fix ourselves, right? Right. And, and, it, and we don't have to take it negative all the time. Like, you know, we don't have to take it as an attack. Mm -hmm. We can take it as a learning lesson that, oh, maybe we absolutely that. that's the key word right there. Miss Liz is the learning part. Yep. I think that we're always so busy trying to defend our stance that we miss the learning opportunities and what someone who has a different opinion might be able to share with us. Yeah. Well, we go on defense, right? Because that's what society and that's what social media shows yep. us. Right. Yes. Yep. Hate wins yep. and love love is and love is blind, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
you, you know, and change artists is have it really hard. It's not an easy job, you know, because it's not for the easy hearted people out there. So I want to talk about change. Okay. What changes, what changes would you like to see Lisa in today's world? In the world? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't like all the division that we have. I feel like in the last um, six, seven, eight years that people have been put in these boxes and instead of being people, they're, you know, it's black people, it's gay people, it's old people, it's um, Islamic people. It's, you know, like everybody's got these boxes and the truth is, is we're all people. And I think that, you know, it's like, if I could bring my art in for a minute, you know, when you have a painting that's just black and white outlines, it's not, it's, I mean, it could be a nice painting, but it's not interesting. If you start painting in the colors, now it becomes a lot more interesting. And I feel like that's what different perspectives and different, um, you know, religions and backgrounds and, and ideology, I, ideology um, helps bring us more color to our life. And I, you know, imagine this. Imagine if I only relied on what's in my head for the rest of my life. What a very narrow, boring life I would have. I love to learn. I love to hear what people from different places have to say about anything, basically, because I want a different perspective. I want my perspective to be much, much more broad. And so I think that um, that doing that, allowing that in, gives me uh, maybe a better lens with which to look at the world. Right. It's those rose-colored glasses. I think, you know, if we all took them off, we could see a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you said about people, right? We're all people, but we're all put into these people boxes, mm -hmm. you know, instead of just being together. And I'm mm -hmm. like you, the division is, it, it's, it's getting outrageous, right? Yeah. Um, and we need to start bringing people together and making that change. And I love that you brought the art in there because art is educational, right? And mm -hmm. so how long have you been doing art, Lisa? Um, so when I was a little girl, I was going to be an artist when I grew up and I used to draw in front of the TV in a little like spiral notebook. And I just had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks full of art. And when I first went to college, I went for art and then, you know, life happens and you, you know, things don't always turn out the way you want them to. So I've been doing art since I was a little girl, but, um, when COVID hit, um, right at the beginning, I actually got it right at the beginning almost. And thankfully, I didn't get it super bad, but that was when you had to quarantine for two weeks because we didn't know like all the, you know, the transmissions and whatnot. And so I felt bad for like three days. And then um, I felt I was bored for the rest of the time. And so my niece had asked me to uh, paint some tennis shoes for her. And I did. And so one of my friends saw it and they're like, hey, make some for me and so on and so on. Anyway, now all that to say, I have a, a transformed of the living room in my house to my art studio. So I have a full art studio in the front of my house okay. and still um, do commissions and artwork um, fairly regularly. Yeah. So art's been a big part of my life. So can people find your art on your website? No, um, they can't, uh, but they can. Uh, I do have a Facebook page and an Instagram. It's um, Soul Fifty One Designs, S O U L, the number five one in designs, um, which I'm not I'm not really great at updating it, but you can find my stuff on there and see what I what I've done. Yeah. Well, social media does take a lot of time, guys. Like <laughs> it does. It really does. Yeah. You can be. It's, it's not easy, right? Like, you know, it takes away from the moment the present moment. It does. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, I see a lot of people, I, I love to watch YouTube artists because I get to see other artists and how they do things. And those poor guys, they come out with a video like every week and they get just burnt out big time. And so I, when I first started, I thought I would, you know, shoot a lot of video and I set up a little video area in there. I, I have not shot a ton of video because I just, one, I don't want to take the joy away from doing art. But two, it is, it's like another job. It really is. And these guys just spend so much time on that, that I got to think that they just don't love doing art anymore. And I don't want to, I don't want that to happen to me. Well, when you lose the passion, right? It's like a dream, dream killer, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Lisa, I'm going to take you in a different direction now. Okay. You talk about customer service. Mm -hmm. I, I notice. So what do you, what, what kind of topics do you bring about customer service to the table? That's a great question because it's not the customer service that I think most people think. So I do have a, pres a presentation that I call everyday customer service. And it is about treating every person that you run into as your best customer. Um, so it, uh, I had read this book. Oh my gosh, what's the name of the book? Um, the Fred Factor. And it was about a, um, a mailman who just like gave the best customer service on the planet to his the people on his route so much so that they really really depended on him he you know like he would check in on the elderly people he would you know walk the dog he would um you know just i mean just the customer service was crazy and i thought man what if we treated everybody like that how much different would this world be if you know like you have a company and people are like, well, that's our number one customer and we've got to take really good care of them. And that person gets special treatment. Well, why not do that for everybody? Why not treat everyone special as if they were your best customer service or your best customer and you give them that customer service as if they were. And, you know, how, I mean, how different could, you know, first of all, when I treat people nicely, I get something out of it too. I get a rush. But so do they. I mean, you never know when you just doing the smallest thing is going to change someone's day or someone's year or someone's life even. And so, you know, part of my mission is that I want to I want to leave the world in a better place than it was when I got here. And so I thought about this concept of everyday customer service, about just treating every single person that that you run into on a daily basis as if they were your best customer service. I mean, that, they're your best customer. <laughs> and the reason that I asked that question is because a lot of people would think customer service, like going into a store, going shopping, right? You know, but how do we treat customer service in today's world as well? Right? Because we have all these automated machines that we're doing our own service. And we're critiquing ourselves. I know when I go to the checkouts, because all the other aisles are locked up now, you know, I'm like, seriously, like, can I do this better? And then you have to rank, rank yourself at the end, right? Mm -hmm. And my spouse will always ask me, why did you give yourself a one today? I was like, I'm in the moody day. Like I'm having a bad day. And then three, and he's like, that, that, that puts it all their numbers. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm critiquing myself, like how I serve myself today. Like, you know, well, I think that's something that, that, that I talk about in that presentation is you also have to treat yourself as your best customer. We are hypercritical of ourselves. We don't cut ourselves any breaks. We are so hard on ourselves. Um, you know, we, we sometimes we have uh, like negative self-talk and, you know, we don't, we definitely, I'll just speak for myself. There's sometimes when I'll say things like, you're so stupid, Lisa. And, you know, th those words have impact. Yep. And, you know, so I, I remind people, not only do you want to treat everybody else like your best customer, but you also want to treat yourself like your best customer. So when, when you have those days, Lisa, where, when you give that negative talk, right? So how do you switch it? Like, um, well, CrossFit definitely helps, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, getting out there and, and, uh, you know, throwing some weights around helps, but I also, you know, I have my art, which I can have as a, um, you know, a, an outlet for me. Um, I have a garden that I have, that's an outlet for me. Um, I have three dogs and my family and my wife, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I have a really great support system. Um, so when I get in those moods, I, I, I can't stay there very long because I just, I, I, in living in my life, I just can't stay there for very long. People, they don't let me off the hook. And I've given my friends and my family permission to, you know, let me wallow for a day or two, but then to kick my butt and get me out of there. So. Well, it, it goes back to having a good support system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm super fortunate that I really do. I'm, I, I can't even, I, I can't be, uh, I can't express the gratitude enough that I have for, for my support system. Well, and that brings us into your tea because your first word that you gave me was thanks. Yes. So why'd you get, why'd you give me that word, Lisa? I think people forget about that anymore. I, you know, people don't say thanks a lot anymore. People, you know, I, it's, it's, the, the times when you hear from people is when something wrong has happened, when something bad has happened, when they want to complain about something. And I think it's just so powerful to tell someone, hey, 
thank you for whatever it was. Thank you for just calling me today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for um, supporting me at the gym. Thank you for having me on your podcast. You know, I, I don't think people say thank you enough anymore. And I, it's very powerful for me. And then your second word was empathy. Mm -hmm. So I think put yourself in other people's shoes. And I think that if you understand where they're coming from, that maybe you'll see things differently because, you know, people, I think they were very, we, we have a very narrow filter or a very narrow perspective sometimes. And we only see how things are affecting us. And if we were to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see how something might be for them, then I think we would have a different perspective about what their life is like or why they feel the way they feel. And so empathy, I think, is also very, very powerful. Well, and, and by saying that, you're not saying that you want to walk in that person's shoes. You want to understand that person's shoes. Yes. You know, because yes. a lot of people will say, well, if I walked in your shoes, I would do this, 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 and this. That's mm -hmm. not what we're saying. We're just trying to no. say, understand the steps that we yeah. have to take and the choices that we had to take, right? Yes, you, absolutely. That's yeah. the thing is people don't understand what choices we had to pick from to do what we had to do. Mm, totally. So, so your last word is advocacy. So why that word? That's my favorite one. Um, like I said, my mom was the voice for me before I had my own voice. And I think, you know, with the boxes that everybody's getting put in, I think sometimes we think, well, you know, I'm only going to advocate for the gay people or the black people or whatever my group is. And I think we have to, I personally will advocate for everybody because I think humans are all important. And I think that if I, you know, I don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to be the complainer. I want to be part of the solution. So being part of the solution means I'm going to help be a voice for everybody who doesn't have their own voice yet. I think advocacy is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, some people just don't, they're just not strong enough to fight for themselves yet. Um, What's the you know, voice so, for the voiceless, right? Totally. Yes. You know, and by sharing our stories and by getting it out there, <clears throat> hopefully we're, we're giving people the courage to stand up and speak as well. Even if you have a shaky voice, when you first start sharing your story, share your story because your story, your story does make a difference. You know, the, and I love the word advocacy because that's, and I do that a lot. And, you know, and like you said, Lisa, we don't just need to advocate for a certain group. We as human beings can advocate for everything. You know, we can mm -hmm. have that voice and stand up. If you see something that's not right, you know, speak up and change it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Lisa, you also offer the breakout, uh, breakout sessions. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what the breakout sessions are? Yeah. So breakout sessions are, uh, you know, when I do a keynote, it's usually in front of a, a big group of people where I can't really interact as much as I would like to. Um, breakout session, sessions are a, usually a smaller group of people where I can get a little bit more interactive. Um, you know, I can work uh, maybe a little bit more intimately with some people in the audience. Um, you're not in a room of 800 people. You might be in a room of 100 people or 50 people or even smaller. And um, so sometimes breakout sessions are even more fun because you get to actually interact a lot more and get like, I'll get off the stage and go down there and walk around and talk to people and sit at their table or whatever, because I, um, you know, I don't see myself um, on a different level. I want to get down and talk to everybody. I mean, I'll, I'll sit on the floor even. I've done that a handful of times where I'll sit on the floor and someone and listen, listen to them talk. I just think it's, um, I'm a big, um, a big pro uh, a proponent of, of, um, get, you know, being together with people. And, you know, it's like when COVID happened and we couldn't do that, it was really tough. So when COVID was over and we could go back to speaking, I really wanted to connect with people more like that again. Well, and, and there was a lot of change, right? For a lot of <clears throat> speakers back then because yes. we were all locked up, right? So where yeah. did we go? We went to virtual land, but it was not the yes. same. Uh, mm -mm, as, a, as, a, as a speaker, it is not the same as the in-person 
uh, you know, you can do, you can speak on a screen like we're doing right now, but right. in person, it, that connection, right? That one-on-one -on -one yes. connection, that the engagement of the audience, seeing if they're really mm -hmm. interested, if they're really understanding what, what we're speaking on, you, you know, um, what, what is one uh, event that really stands out to you that really impacted your life? Oh, uh, I know exactly which one that was. Um, I spoke in Connecticut um, two years ago uh, in April for the New England Resident Service Coordinators. And that was a room of like 800 plus people. And we were talking about the, the magic of goal setting. And this was, um, the room was just, those guys were, they were an amazing group. I. I learned so much from them. Their energy was just off the charts. I I really left. I I mean that I got just as much out of that presentation as I'm sure they did because I just was like at one point I just sat down and I let them talk because they were just just so engaged and so energetic about it that I was like I even said okay here's next year's uh, <laughs> keynote speaker right here. I mean they were just they were on fire and I loved every, every, every second of that, of that engagement. It just was just probably the most um, impactful for me in, in all the years I've been speaking. So Lisa, what makes a good keynote speaker? Um, what makes a good keynote speaker? I think a, a few things make a good keynote speaker. I think you have to be engaging. I think um, it's, I, I'll just speak for myself. I, I think I'm a good keynote speaker. Um, I am not scripted, um, which not, is not to say that scripted keynote speakers are bad, but I know what I want to say, but I like to try and feel the energy from the people I'm talking to and, and they actually direct the way the presentation goes. Um, I think that adding humor in is really important because I think if I take myself too seriously, then I think I'll lose a crowd. I like to infuse humor. I like to infuse um, stories. Uh, I tell a lot of stories about my own family uh, or my own experiences. I like to engage the the audience and have them interact and tell you know give me their feedback or tell me their stories or how something that we're we're ch challenging them challenging them on is affecting them. And then we crowdsource and we solve the problem right there in the group. So I think a, a a good keynote is someone who um, doesn't talk at you for 60 minutes. It's a conversation. It is a give and take. It is sharing of energy. And I'm listening as much as I'm speaking when I'm doing a keynote. So do you crack a joke when you open up when you first start your uh, presentation? <laughs> I, I crack a lot of jokes. Um, I, you know, I like to throw them in there and usually, you know, it might be a, um, you know, self-deprecating. Um, I, it depends on the presentation. I've got areas in every part of the, of all my presentations where I have something that I can say about me that is hopefully going to infuse some humor in, uh, in the presentation for them. And, um, I, even my, my decks sometimes have, um, like, a. I have uh, in one deck, I have a uh, Ricky Bobby on a deck. I have um, people dancing funny on one of my decks and I make everybody get up and dance like that. Um, so I try to keep it lighthearted, but still impactful. And I, I think humor is used in the right degree is really a very strong tool for a speaker. So do you have any uh, events coming up that uh, you'd like? To I do. I do. I'm going to be in Omaha. Um, speaking for their um, for a group um, who is based in Omaha. This is they get together uh, once a year. I'm doing a, an HR summit for them, and then I'm also going to be um, the MC for their um, leadership program for the next two days after that. So I'll be there in September, um, and then I've got a couple things that uh, we're still working on before the end of the year. So Lisa, when I asked you to give me one word to describe yourself, you gave me the word multi-faucet. Faceted, yeah. Faceted. Can you tell me why that word? Um, there are a lot of sides to me. I mean, if you just look at my jobs alone, I mean, I've been a, 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 liquor, a liquor distributor artist. I've been a touring musician. I've been a fishing salesperson. 
I have had my own marketing firm. I ran my family business. I owned a construction company. And, uh, you know, now I'm a professional speaker. So I think all of those experiences have like, I feel like I've been there, got the t-shirt, you know, I, I, there's a lot of sides of me that are important to me. And, um, so when I say multifaceted, it's because I don't think there's one thing about me that's, um, that sticks out more than another. I think I'm a kind of a, a balanced person. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but there are definitely a lot of sides to me for sure. When, when I got that word, I was like, Oh, this is going to be interesting. I've never gotten that before. <laughs> I suppose. Is it a still one word? Is it a hyphened one word? Or well, it's is a it hyphen one word. One word. Yeah. <laughs> I, I say it's a one word, right? When we put the hyphen, it's still a word, you know, it's like okay. the TEA. There's a hyphen. It, it's T, Fair right? Enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah. So Lisa, I also asked you what your favorite color was and you gave me red. So why red? Red is like the color of passion. It's the color of, it's the color of fire. And, you know, I'm passionate about the things I do in the world. And I, plus, you know, I had my colors done and they said red was a good color for me, but I love red because I think it's just such a, it, it, it emotes like emotion. Like when you see red, you feel like passion and fiery. And, and, you know, I think red is just a color that people just can see and go, Ooh, I know already, you know? So I, red has always been my favorite color. I have a lot of colors that I like, but I think red has always been a good color for me. I think red is that standout color, right? Here she comes. For sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> warning. 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 Yes, exactly. Her feet are on the ground. Watch out. She's coming. <laughs> exactly. And the reason that I asked that question about the colors is because question, you know, colors mean something to us as well, right? They, they oh, might yeah. relate to a memory, as you know, yes. uh, a loved one, uh, a a time of travel where we went, a piece of jewelry, stuff like that, right? It's more than just the color, right? And oh, I, I yeah. always like to know why people pick those colors. Um, and red is that go color, like, let's go, like, yeah. No, I mean, no a lot plane. of people would say, let's stop because of a stoplight, but I don't see it that way. I see it as, you know, ignition, go, let's go. So yeah. I, I think red is an explosive color, yeah. Well, I think it's that impact, right? The little, little absolutely steps, the big impact yes. again. We're going right back exactly. to that big impact. That's uh, right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so Lisa, if anybody would like to grab that book, where could they find that book? Uh, it is available on Amazon. Um, uh, it's um, you just go to uh, think small book, uh, the little book with big impact and you will find it. It's nine 99 on Amazon plus whatever the shipping is. I didn't want it to be a big price point because I wanted it to be, um, you know, I wanted everybody to be able to, to grab it. And uh, I, I'm pleasantly surprised with the sales that I've had. And, um, you know, every so often someone will come up to me and say, hey, I read your book. I, I just saw someone a couple of weeks ago and she was like, I read your book. It was so good. And I was not, uh, it's just kind of cool for people to, to tell me that, you know, I get, I just get tickled every time I hear someone read the book. So when, you, when you're doing a keynote speak, uh, do you bring your books as well? Lisa? Um, I, I will, um, if they allow that, um, sometimes what I do is I'll use them for like, um, like if someone participates, I'll give them a book. Um, I, I haven't actually sold them at a presentation yet. Um, but I do bring them to give away to people and, you know, um, I'll sign them for people if they want. And, um, it's, that's worked out really well. Well, that's really awesome. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Like we're going into a lot of different flows and all of we that. Sure, are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it into the mastering change because you also offer that service uh, that I seen. So what is that about? Um, so, well, if I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna tell on myself a little bit. I hate change. I've always hated change. I'm one of those people who's like, I like this and this and this to all line up. My friends all tease me because everything in my office is all lined up, and if you move something, I know it. And so I thought I better start learning how to embrace change because change is always right. Change happens all the time. There's been so much change that's happened in my life. There's been so much change that has happened in the world, even in just the last year. And so I thought I I've got to embrace change. And so I think for me, mastering change is um, 
is kind of reframing it as curiosity and saying, I'm going to be curious about something rather than, wow, someone changed this. I don't know. Well, if I, if I reframe it as curiosity, then all of a sudden it's a little bit more, uh, it's easier to, to manage for, for me. So uh, I try to look at change as curiosity. And I think, you know, uh, instead of being like, uh, oh, I can't believe I'm going to, I'm going to miss my plane. I, you know, my plane's delayed. Well, I'm curious, what can I do while I'm here since I'm going to be here for another three hours? Um, you know, or I'm, I'm curious if I can lift more weight in my workout, or I'm curious if I can talk to more people or if I can, um, you know, there's so many places in the world that it's, it's change and challenge. And I think that if you get curious about those things, all of a sudden you're in power, you're in control. And so that's the way I kind of try to, to master change by, by reframing it. So what were you afraid of for change? Was it the comfort zone? Oh my God. I, I mean, I, listen, I, I've lived in Florida almost my whole life. Well, in 2000, I moved to West Virginia for three years and I thought I was going to lose my mind because it was totally different than anything I'd ever, any place I'd ever lived. And I, you know, I did, was doing a job traveling around in places I didn't know, but the entire, my whole world changed. And I realized when I did that, all right, kid, you, you got to get in control here. And I, I, I've been afraid of most things in my life. And I finally said, I cannot live in fear. Um, you know, change isn't not being fearful. Change is being fearful and you know, curiosity and, and challenging yourself and then still doing it anyway. And so I, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not afraid of things anymore. I still don't like, um, I, I still don't like snakes. Um, and I still, too. you know, I no snakes. I don't like them. I, I, you know, I still have to catch myself to roll with whatever's happening because it's not on my schedule. Um, but I'm getting better at it. It's a practice that I, I work at. Well, I'm I'm with you on the snakes. I don't like snakes either. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> so I'm gonna we're almost at the end here, Lisa. I'm gonna ask you about your heritage. So you're Cuban and Italian. So yes. what 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 cuisine do you like better? Cuban or oh. Italian or both? <laughs> I think Cuban. Um so my mom my mom was Cuban, my dad was Italian. And um, my mom cooked a lot of Cuban food. My dad's mom, my nana, cooked a lot of Italian food. But, you know, we, I think we probably ate more Cuban food because our mom, you know, showed us what to do. And, and you know, at, at the holidays, we have a little bit of both. Um, but I like a good black beans and, and pork, you know, as much as the next person and a good Cuban sandwich, which we have in Tampa. Um, I, I love some lasagna. I love some spaghetti. I love all of that. But I think, if I'm going to have to choose one, it's going to be the Cuban side. <laughs> Do you have a favorite recipe besides the black beans and rice? Oh, my favorite recipes are, um, I have this recipe that was a special recipe with my mom and I, and it's not Cuban or Italian, um, but at Christmas, my mom and I would always make these things called cowboy cookies, and they basically have everything in them. I mean, you think of it and you can put, I mean, it's got oatmeal, chocolate chips, uh, toffee, um, um, gosh, I can't even think about coconut, um, nuts. I mean, everything is in this cookie and I only make it once a year at Christmas. And like I said, it was a cookie that my mom and I first started making at Christmas. And that's probably my favorite recipe. And I won't make it any other time of year. I just make it at Christmas and everybody's like, are you making the cowboy cookies this year? And I'm like, yes, I am. So I would have to say that's <laughs> that's a good memory because it, you know, it's, it's something that my mom and I did together and something that, you know, it's like a tradition that I always take forward with me. Well, and, and it sounds like in the book, the, the little book, the think small, little mm -hmm. big impact, right? It's making those cookies, adding mm -hmm. all the little things and the big yes. impact of that amazing cookie. Right. And you yes. only get it at certain times of the year. So yes. it's, you know, I, I can see this, the the title of your book through your whole life. Like as you've been sharing your, your tea today, 
uh, I see the big impact of little uh, stuff in life, like the little movements coming out and speaking and moving and, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. There's a lot mm -hmm. of big impact with the little steps that you had to take in life. So what final message would you like to leave everybody today with, Lisa? Oh, kindness. I think that um, we've forgotten how to be kind in the world. And, you know, something that I've always said about kindness is it doesn't require any formal education. It doesn't require any equipment. It doesn't require any pre-planning. You can just walk out your door and be kind immediately. And I think that if we were kinder to each other, then the world would be a lot different place. Um, so my challenge when I speak to people is always, you know, who can you be kind to today? How many people can you touch with your kindness today? How many lives can you impact with kindness today? And um, that's, that's to me, that's just, I mean, I think everything comes off of kindness. Well, I really want to thank you for your kindness today, because without us connecting, we wouldn't be having this incredible conversation together. So Absolutely. thank you for that, Lisa. So if yes. anybody would like to reach out to you to have you on their podcast or on their show as well, where can they find you? Um, LisaDemi.com is the easiest place to, to it's my website. So it's, uh, it's on the screen here. It's um, D-E-M-M-I. Uh, or you can find me at Lisa Demi on almost all my socials. I'm usually on uh, Instagram and Facebook quite a bit. Um, but I'm, you can also ca catch me on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and TikTok. So I'm, I'm, I'm on all of them. So well, I really want to thank you. And thank you to the listeners and audience for joining me today on Tea Time. Uh, we do have some special announcements that are going to be uh, released on the 24th. So we have September's lineup coming up. Uh, we also have an incredible guest joining us tonight at 7 p.m., Patty uh, Townley uh, Converge. And she'll be sharing her self-awareness as well and coming out about sexuality and social issues. So I, I kind of see how the alignment of my two guests again for this week have connected without even knowing that about you, Lisa. So thank you for exactly. that. Exactly. You yeah. know, this is how the universe works. It, it works in magical ways. Um, if anybody would like to know more about any of the Tea Time guests, you can check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizesteatime.com. No S on Tea Time. Uh, if you'd like to check out the YouTube it is on it. So be careful where you're checking on the platforms because there are some with no S and some with, with, uh, with the S. So um, again, I want to thank you, Lisa, for coming out and sharing your tea. Uh, you know, I, you really brought a strong, impactful message today to the listeners. And uh, I really encourage you to keep staying strong and keep doing what you're doing and get your art out there. And I'll be checking that art out. Um, yes, ma'am. So before we wrap up, Lisa, um, I want to go back into the T one last time. So your, sure. your words were thanks, empathy, and advocacy. So mm -hmm. when you put those three words together, what thought comes to mind for you? Um, love, love. I think that those things add up to love. And I think um, we, we need to bring love back into the world. There's a lot of hate these days. And I feel like, you know, you, you had said it, love is blind, but love wins. And I, I think when you look at thanks, empathy, and advocacy, advocacy, it spells love to me. Well, thank you so much. And that's what we do here. We do not the beverage. We do storytelling and words. So thank you again for everybody out there. Again, if you'd like to know more about Miss Liz, just check out Miss Liz on all social media platforms and give the, the YouTube channel a good subscribe and check out this tea time in your house and in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. If you just want something to listen to, listen to Lisa and all the incredible things that she's doing. And I will see everybody again tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we'll be sharing another TEA for all of you guys out there. And we're just going to keep spilling these teas. And if you'd like to share your tea, and not as a guest, but just your tea with Miss Liz, put it in the comments section. I always like to know what people are what words they're using for their story to tell, because that's your story is your strong tea. And we, we serve and spill tea in a different way in this house. So until then, I will see everybody tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Keep staying true and keep serving your tea one cup at a time.